Hey guys, how's it going? So today I am going to be doing a Q&A video for you all. Earlier this week, I asked you guys to send me all your questions and you guys sent a lot of questions uh, in various topics such as paganism, witchcraft, Wicca, and even personal questions. So this is gonna be a fun video. Of course, I can't answer all of your questions, but I am going to answer a lot of them. So get cozy, maybe make yourself a coffee or tea, and we're gonna jump into it. So the first question I have is, what's the best way to get started into paganism? So I get this question a lot, but paganism itself is really difficult to define and there's not any one particular way or method to becoming a pagan. But in my view, one of the things you can start with is looking at different branches of paganism to see which branch fits you, your beliefs, your interests the most, because there are a lot of them. Some of them are more generalized, like Wicca. Uh, some of them are specific to certain ancient pagan cultures. So you have Norse paganism or Celtic paganism, for example. So spending some time to learn about these different branches will help you have a better idea of what rituals to perform, how to connect with the deities, what holidays to celebrate. So doing a little reading and finding out which system fits you best. And also, you know, once you figure that out, then you can go online and find book recommendations for that specific path. Now that doesn't mean you're locked into that path for life. I've made many switches to different branches of paganism over the years and that's okay too. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. I also highly recommend finding a community, whether that's online or in person, as that will kind of help you through the process of becoming pagan as well. Next question, let's see. Do you think paganism will be accepted by modern communities as a religion to be respected alongside the other religions? Or will paganism always be spurned? That's really tough to answer, and I might be a bit pessimistic here. I do think pagans will always be outsiders as long as the most powerful countries in the world follow predominantly monotheistic religions. And that's because with monotheism, there is only one God and any other religion that does not believe in that one God is considered in their viewpoint wrong and that those people need to be converted or changed. So as long as monotheism is the main religion in the world, that puts us pagans that tend to be more open-minded into which gods we work with into a bit of a tough spot. So I do think we'll always be outsiders, but I don't necessarily believe that's a bad thing. I think our communities could be potentially even stronger because, you know, we are a bit alone in the world. If I'm thinking more optimistically on some days, I like to think that there could be a future where we are predominantly a pagan world and that we do value nature and the spirits and the consciousness that exists all around us more. But, you know, in likelihood, if that does ever happen, it's centuries away. Let's see, the next question is about self-initiation in Wicca. So a lot of pagans start out with Wicca. That's what I did. Of course, you don't have to. And things are kind of changing in that regards. And with Wicca, it has changed a lot as well over the decades. You know, it started in mostly a coven system where you had to kind of go through a formal initiation ceremony and be initiated by a specific high priest or priestess. Though in the 90s, the concept of self-initiation started uh, trending, I guess. I personally did a self-initiation ceremony when I was a teenager, and I think they can be just as powerful and as meaningful as a regular initiation ceremony. So I definitely believe that 
you should go for it <laughs> if you want to do your own self-initiation. I don't think there's anything that's inherently wrong with self-initiation. And for a lot of us that might not live near other Wiccan communities or even pagan communities, it sometimes is the only option. My next question is, could a witch change the gods he or she is working with in their practice? I definitely think so. I don't think you have to be locked into working with specific deities for your entire life. Like any relationship, friendship, connection, these things evolve and change as you grow and develop in your practice. So yes, there may be some pagans that started working with the same deities and they've been working with them for life. Though many of us evolve and change where we might feel the need to work with certain deities at a certain moment in our life, but as we change, maybe we want to start working with other ones. And I think that's okay. After all, paganism does allow us a lot of freedom in terms of which gods and goddesses we choose to work with. We have a, another question here about deity. To what extent is it reasonable to use the stories of one tradition to fill in the blanks of another? For example, we know a lot about Venus, but comparatively little about Freya. Since the two seem linked, how much can we really learn about Freya by studying Venus? This is a great question, and uh, syncretism is something I personally believe in to an extent. That is that there might be some underlying universal truths, and every single culture has interacted with these universal truths and kind of viewed it through the lens of their own cultural beliefs and systems. So that means most pagan cultures have a goddess of love, for example, or a god of war. So they are connected maybe at the core. However, each culture is viewing it through their own lens. So they also have a lot of differences. So. Yes, you can learn a bit about Freya by studying Venus. However, Freya is one of the Norse pagan goddesses, so that means she is existing within a Norse pagan worldview and cosmology, which is very different than the Greeks or the Romans. Uh, for example, Freya isn't just a goddess of love, she's also a war goddess in some people's view. So. If you really want to understand a deity, you can't just look at what that archetype is representing, but also you need to look at the culture and try to understand the philosophy and the cosmology and the day-to-day -day life of that particular culture to have a better understanding of that deity. So. In my view, because I'm a history nerd, that makes it fun. I like learning about the different cultures. But but yeah, so I think it's a tough question. Yes, you can learn about the deities by looking at their corresponding deity in other cultures, but it'll only get you so far. You also have to study that originating culture. Uh, another question on kind of a similar vein here. Do you plan on learning more about Hinduism in the process of reconstructing Norse and Celtic pagan traditions? These three traditions have common roots, and since Hinduism is the only tradition that still survives in its ancient form, it would be wonderful to see the similarities. Yeah, I think this is super interesting, and I don't yet know that much about Hinduism, but I do plan on learning more about Hinduism because it is so unique. It is a pagan culture and religion that has survived the millennia, and it's true that the root of Hinduism is the same root that created other pagan cultures like Norse paganism or Celtic paganism. So I think you can learn about those European pagan traditions from Hinduism to a certain extent. It's especially beneficial in cultures like Celtic and Norse paganism where we don't have that many written sources to study and work with. Though again, it can only get you so far because Hinduism is going to be viewed through a lens of Indian culture. 
Whereas Norse paganism and Celtic paganism, for example, they have their own cultural systems that you kind of have to look at the religion through. So yes, I think you can learn a lot by looking into Hinduism, but again, it's only going to take you so far. Next question. How can a pagan break free from religious fundamentalism and indoctrination? Wow, this is tough because I feel like many pagans nowadays struggle with this, especially if they've grown up in a uh, very religious household. I know many pagans grew up in families that were very Christian and they had to go to church regularly and had these kind of uh, ideas of morality kind of thrown at them from a young age. And it can take time to kind of separate yourself from that. One of the things I realized as I've grown is that many Christians themselves don't actually read the Bible or know their own history of Christianity. And as I've studied different religions and religious history over the years, the more I've come to realize that the Christianity that people go to church and interact with <laughs> is very different from the historical Christianity. So there's kind of this huge disconnect just within modern Christianity and how it is kind of indoctrinated into our culture from what the history is. Once you realize that fact, uh, you can understand that what people are kind of pounding into your skulls um, doesn't even have much basis in historical Christianity, and it kind of loses some weight, in my view, at least. And you realize that, oh, all these people that are kind of bringing this hatred towards me, perhaps, um, they don't even understand their own history. So I don't really need to take what they're saying as strongly. Uh, so that was something that kind of helped me get over some of this indoctrination once you realize that the majority of it doesn't have much basis in actual history, especially, you know, in terms of Christianity. When you really do study the life of Jesus, his beliefs, and realize that the vast majority of what's said in Sunday sermons doesn't connect. <laughs> Um, so that helped, but also kind of finding, I think, a pagan community can help too. It can feel really lonely as a pagan and um, when at the same time we're, we're feeling kind of wrapped up in this world that is so defined by monotheistic ideas, it can really help to, to find some friends um, that also share your beliefs and that can slowly help to kind of reduce this indoctrination feeling <laughs> that you might have from living in this modern Western society. Okay, next question. Does it make any sense that I'm an atheist but can't make myself believe in God's magic, etc.? But at the same time, I feel such a huge connection with paganism, runes, the process of spells, or just when I spend time in nature. Yeah, I think there are many people out there that like the concept of paganism, like the morality or the cosmology of paganism, but don't necessarily believe in magic or specific gods and goddesses. And I think that's okay to a certain extent. In paganism, the faith component is not as important as your actions and how you live your life. When you look at, say, ancient Greek philosophers, many of them didn't necessarily literally believe in gods and goddesses, but they were still pagan because they had a pagan worldview and they lived in a pagan society. So faith is not as important in paganism. I think it's nice to have and many pagans are really strong in their faith but i don't think you need to believe in a literal conception of the gods and goddesses there are other ways to think about deity too some people view deity as archetypal manifestations so for example venus 
isn't necessarily a goddess living in the heavens, but she is an archetypal representation of love and lust. And how we as humans interact with those concepts is we anthropomorphize them because that's easier uh, for us to fully understand and interact with those ideas and feelings. So you can look at deity in that way. In terms of spell work, you could choose to look at spell work as a way of working with the placebo effect and the powers of the placebo effect. After all, we do know scientifically placebo is a really strong force and spells can kind of be a way to supercharge <laughs> the placebo effect in your favor. So there are lots of scientific ways to look at the concepts of deity and spells. And in my view, you could still consider yourself pagan if you choose to follow those more scientific conceptions of paganism. So yeah, you know, not everyone's gonna agree with me here, but I think there is a lot of leeway with paganism when it comes to faith. Okay, next question is, why in your opinion did the pagan world fall to Christian invasion? This is a really interesting question, and I think there are several factors. One factor is commerce, and one of the ways to look at that is by studying the Vikings. So the Vikings, you know, were really interested in not just, you know, pillaging, but also trade. And they wanted to be able to trade with the English. And because Britain at the time was very Christian and would not necessarily want to trade or work with someone who was pagan, they kind of decided that, oh, we'll only trade with you if you choose to be baptized. So many Vikings were baptized just because they wanted to do trade. So becoming Christian was a prerequisite to gaining any power within Britain or to be able to trade freely. So many of them just converted for logistics sense and it wouldn't be any necessary problem to add on another deity, <laughs> right? So you could easily just add on Jesus into your normal array of pagan gods. So that whole system was kind of like a frog in the boiling water scenario. As more and more trade occurred and as the prerequisite to trade and power was of course conversion, slowly people um, lost their pagan beliefs and became more Christian as just kind of that was what you needed to do in order to interact with these Christian societies. So that's one side. On the other side, you do have forcible Christianity. I mean, a lot of people were converted by force or they feared death if they didn't convert. So you do have that side as well. So I think it's kind of a combination of those two things, both force and the desire to trade and interact with these Christian societies that eventually over time led to Christianity becoming dominant. Though I think there are many other factors here that you know add into it. So I'm, I'd love to hear your thoughts, some of you that have more education on this question. Uh, definitely let me know your two cents on this question down in the comments. Okay, next question. What's your favorite and least favorite parts about paganism and witchcraft? I think probably the best thing is just finally finding something that I connect with on a spiritual and a moral level. I find it very comforting that I have these beliefs and I felt that before I had them, I was kind of lost. <laughs> so just that sense of, of comfort in finding this system, this community, um, these beliefs, I find that it really has improved my life. On the negative side, probably I would say the lack of physical community spaces is something I really struggle with. There aren't many meeting places in paganism. It's not like Christianity where there's a church around every corner. It's tricky to meet other pagans in real life. 
And I do think that is starting to change and I do often attend like meetup groups and workshops and things like that. But I do wish we had a better infrastructure when it came to physical meeting locations. So that can be a downside. You do feel kind of lonely sometimes, but overall I wouldn't change it for anything. I, I love being pagan. So the next question I have is, what do you find are the best methods for grounding? So this is a practice that can be really good for ritual or spell work. And sometimes after you've kind of exerted a lot of energy into the universe, you can feel a bit dizzy or like you have like low blood sugar or sometimes you just kind of feel exhausted. So that's where grounding strategies come in. Some of the easiest ones I like are just physically going outside and uh, with bare feet, just feeling the ground beneath my feet and kind of visualize my feet kind of rooting into the earth. Uh, another thing is eating something. That's why you might hear the phrase cakes and ale after a ritual. Sometimes you just kind of need to, to eat something to regain your energy after a big ritual takes place. Another thing you can do is develop a consistent meditation practice. And I found that when I do meditate regularly, I do feel more grounded after a ritual or a spell, or I feel kind of more stable energy wise. So that's one of the benefits of just kind of working with meditation on a daily basis or at least a few times a week. Next question, why are there different tools for directing energy such as your hand, wand, or knife? So that's a great question and I feel like I don't have a full understanding of the answer yet. I do think they represent different things symbolically. When you look at the knife or the athame, traditionally it's a symbol that represents uh, masculinity versus the chalice, which represents femininity. So a lot of times in occult practices, you'll see a chalice and an athame or a chalice and a knife kind of coming together, representing that divine union. So that kind of has its own symbolic meaning, but also the idea of metal being a conductor. As we know in science, right? <laughs> metal conducts things. So if you are conducting energy, it might make sense to do so with a metal surface. And with wands, you're really kind of looking at different types of trees and woods. So with that, you're working with the correspondence of the particular wood that you're using for your wand as a way to both direct the energy but to enhance it with that particular correspondence. So you'll see this a lot in traditional witchcraft where certain woods like blackthorn might be associated with certain types of spells. So you kind of can play around with different types of woods and different types of wands depending on what type of spell or ritual you're doing. Um, in terms of your hand, that makes sense because sometimes we don't have tools and we don't necessarily need tools to perform spells and rituals and we can use what we have. So a lot of occult and spell practices just involve you using your hands or your fingers to direct energy. And I think that can be, for the most part, just as effective as using something like a wand or an athame. Next, I wanna share with you a story someone sent about struggling with their paganism and their family's beliefs around it. So this person said, last October, when I was on vacation, my parents went through my bedroom and found all my books, crystals, candles, books of shadows, jewelry, tools, oils, etc., and threw them all out. Since then, my parents have been trying to convert me back to Christianity. I fell out of my practice because they broke my heart and my trust, and I've been too afraid they'll discover I'm nothing like they wanted. But I've wanted so badly to restore my practice, heal from that, and practice and express my spirituality in peace. Do you have any advice or tips on possible steps to begin the journey again unafraid? This is such a sad and difficult story that I think probably many of you can relate with. 
A lot of us have family members that think what we do is wrong or evil, and often they're not even willing to do the research <laughs> and find out what paganism or witchcraft is actually about. And it can be really heartbreaking experiencing that confusion and distrust and hatred from your own family. And it really does break my heart when I read comments like this because I know so many of you guys struggle with, with similar scenarios. So one thing to consider, as difficult as it is, is that you may never really be able to change the mindset of your family when it comes to paganism and witchcraft. Earlier we were talking about indoctrination, and I do think many of people have just spent so many years believing hurtful and, and hateful things about paganism that they're not going to change. And that can be difficult to accept. But there are many of us out there <laughs> that have managed to make it work. And, you know, I'm someone where I don't tell my beliefs to everyone in my family. I keep quiet for the most part. And that's a decision I made because honestly, I just don't want the drama. So I tend to keep my practice a little secretive when it comes to my family members. And yes, that's easier said than done. It can be very difficult if you still live at home. And at which case, I I'm just want to say like it gets easier. Once you do move out, it's so much easier to practice your beliefs without worrying about people rifling through your stuff and finding, you know, all your witchy things. So it does definitely get better. And finding a community either online or in person can definitely help with that because we all share similar struggles, I think, when it comes to this stuff. So having someone you can talk to about your experiences uh, really does help. Also, when it comes to the, the physical stuff, you don't really need that much stuff to start a pagan or a witchcraft practice. So if it's just logistically easier, you don't need to have, you know, a bunch of crystals and, and herbs and wands and uh, things like that. You can, you know, be pagan or a witch just with your own mind and your own bodies and the nature around you. So if you are trying to be secretive, that can help. You don't physically need a lot of stuff, but it is a process and it is something very difficult. Um, I did make a video a while ago about coming out of the broom closet that goes over specific tips and tricks to having a respectful conversation with, you know, your parents or your family or your friends that might disagree with your beliefs. So I'll link that down below in case you want to check that out. Next question. If you could build a pagan temple anywhere, where would it be? This is a fun question and I know it's not realistic, but what I would do is I would start with the pagan places we currently have in the world. So there are many places that are ancient pagan sites and I would use those sites as places to either build new temples near it or, you know, spaces that people could gather who are pagan and perform rituals in these ancient temples. Uh, for example, you have the Pantheon in Rome, uh, which was a ancient Roman pagan temple. It's now a church. So what I would like to do is take it back and return it as a pagan temple. Or you can look at something like the Parthenon in Athens being able to perform rituals again in the Parthenon. Or you could look at the stone circles in Britain being able to perform rituals in those spaces or near the sacred wells or the sacred streams or the um, burial mound sites in Scandinavia. So currently there are a lot of pagan sites that aren't being used right now for modern pagan rituals, and I would love for that to be something that we could do, or at least be able to build new temples next to some of these sites that were historically important for pagans. Next question, how do you make pagan and witchy friends in real life? 
this can be tricky too, depending on where you live. I recommend looking if there are any like new age or witchy bookshops in your city or your area. Usually they do like workshops a couple times a month that you can attend and those can be great ways to meet fellow pagans. Or I recommend looking at meetup.com. There's usually some pagan and witchy events going on that you can attend and find find people there that, that share your beliefs. At least that's how I've met pagans and witches in real life. Next question is, what is the best and worst thing about having a pagan YouTube channel? Uh, the best thing is definitely the community. I feel kind of lonely here sometimes, and I'm sure many of you fellow pagans feel lonely. So having a YouTube channel has allowed me to find and connect with so many other wonderful pagans around the world. And it's been really inspiring and amazing to share stories and tips and tricks with you guys and to celebrate the holidays together. So that's been by far the best thing about having a pagan YouTube channel. The worst thing is the hate. <laughs> um, I do get a lot of hate comments, even death threats sometimes, which are really scary. Um, so, you know, I don't go a day without someone telling me that I should go burn in hell. And that can be difficult. But over the years, I've kind of just like let it slide off my shoulders for the most part. <laughs> Um, so I've gotten used to it. I've built up a bit of a thick skin. Uh, but yeah, it's it's tough putting yourself out there online. And then I have another question on a similar vein, which is how did I manage to grow my YouTube channel? So this is something that I've done slowly over the years. When I started YouTube, I was not very regular with my posting. I kind of just made videos every once in a while. Um, so I didn't really grow very fast. When I started um, making content regularly, uh, that's when things started to change. I think it has to do with just sticking with it. I mean, I'm obviously not like a, a huge YouTuber by any stretch. Um, I've never had a viral video. What I do is I just make content consistently every week and I've had slow and steady growth because of that because honestly, not many people will do that. A lot of people will start YouTube channels, but they won't stick with it. And I've stuck with it for several years now. So I don't need to have a viral video. I just have to keep sharing and uh, creating content for you all. And that's kind of how I've eventually turned all of this into a full-time business. I don't just do YouTube, I also, um, have my tarot deck and I uh, occasionally do tarot readings and lessons and workshops and then I also uh, mentor other pagans with their own pagan businesses. So I've cobbled together a lot of different income streams over the years, but YouTube is my main thing. Um, I love making YouTube content. I love uh, sharing with you guys. So in my view, the best thing you can do is just start and start creating consistent content. And if you stick with that over several years, your channel will grow. Because <laughs> most people won't stick with it. So if you can manage to stick with it, you're going to beat the competition in that regard. Lastly, we have a few questions about tarot. The first question is, what is the difference between oracle cards and tarot cards? So they are very different. Tarot is a specific system that developed in the 1400s in Northern Italy. So there is two sections to a tarot deck. There's the major arcana and the minor arcana, and you learn these cards and their meanings and the symbolism. And what that means is once you learn tarot, you can read with any other tarot deck because they all follow the same archetypes and conventional meanings. Of course, you can layer on complexity and different meanings and tarot spreads and all of that kind of stuff. But essentially, once you learn tarot, you're good. <laughs> you can read with any deck that is also a tarot deck out there. Oracle decks are all different. They don't conform to a specific system. So every time you buy a new Oracle deck, you need to 
learn a new system, which means you'll probably always be using the guidebook with a Oracle deck versus tarot. Once you learn tarot, you're good. You don't need to constantly be pulling out a guidebook and, you know, reading about the different cards. Once you know it, you know it. So that's the biggest difference and that's why I picked tarot because it was something that I could learn and then work with hundreds and hundreds of decks out there and still be able to read from them. Next question is how long does it take to become good at tarot? This is a lifelong practice and journey in my opinion. So even though I think I'm a pretty good reader now, uh, I still, of course, will be learning for the rest of my life because the symbolism uh, always can be more complex and interesting and I can always learn new tarot spreads and new methods for giving readings. I would say that it takes probably around at least a year to get comfortable with reading because there are 78 cards. You do have to learn each card's meaning and get comfortable with that meaning before you're able to layer on your own interpretations, your own intuition and kind of blend that all together. So I would say it takes at least a year, but really it's a lifelong practice. And last question, can you talk a little bit about what has sustained your tarot practice for so long? Do you continue to have new insights and discoveries about the cards? Uh, yes, I definitely do continue to have new insights because tarot is just one system in this wider understanding of the occult and the various occult systems that interact with our society, both historically and today. So you can always add on things to your tarot knowledge, like you can learn Kabbalah and add it on, you can learn art history and add it on, you can learn alchemy and add it on. So there are always new insights to be had, which in my view makes tarot so fun and exciting because I never get bored of it, <laughs> at least I don't. Um, and I always find something new and enjoyable to learn about the practice. So. Yeah, wow, we just covered a lot of questions on a lot of different topics. I hope this was fun and hopefully somewhat informative for you all. I do enjoy doing these Q&As every once in a while. Uh, so I'd like to hear what you thought about some of these questions. If you have your own personal answers to some of these questions, I'd love to read those down in the comments. And of course, you know, I have my own Discord community. So if you are looking for a pagan or a witchy community to join, I'll leave the link for that down below. It is connected with my Patreon. So if you choose to support this channel on Patreon, you do get access to the Discord community. And, you know, I'm here for you guys. If you have questions, always feel free to reach out to me. Instagram is a good way to reach out to me, or probably the best way is just to put a comment down in YouTube as I do check my comments regularly. Uh, I do want to be a source of, of help for you guys and to help you along your own pagan journeys. So please do feel free to reach out. And thank you all so much for watching. If you're not yet subscribed, please consider subscribing. We're a pagan family over here and I'd love to have you join the community. Uh, so thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you later. Bye.